this uh, in front of me, and then I was advancing to him. Then while I was going to Tabo, I see Tokyo. Tokyo. I say, hey, Tokyo, come on. You are making everybody wealthy. You are leaving me <laughs> <laughs> poor there in Nelson Mandela, in Port Elizabeth. Bah, 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 bah. And then I attack him. Bah, talk. Wow, wow, wow. Hey, Kusen, you bop, you bop, you bop, Kusen. <laughs> and... Uh, thank you for tuning in to another exciting episode of the Ultimate Leadership Podcast. My name is Lupumla Jonka. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave us a comment wherever you are consuming the content. Um, this episode is brought to you by Global Leadership Consultants. We are a leadership and business development firm um, based in Nelson Mandela Bay. Today, I'm very, very privileged. I'm very honored um, to be sitting with um, one of the key people I've always been looking forward to meeting. I think the first time, Mr. Jack, I saw you, you were speaking at an event, I think almost seven years ago, that was hosted by Lynn Van Fieren. Yeah. Lynn Van Fieren. And I thought to myself, uh, let me, you know, try and connect uh, to him. So thank you so much for agreeing to talking to us and to talking to all of our viewers and listeners. If you don't know Mr. Jack, uh, he's the author of this amazing book, To Survive and to Succeed, From a Farm Boy to a Businessman. Um, he is currently the deputy mayor of Nelson Mandela Bay. Uh, he's a businessman, struggle stalwart, the chairperson of Bosa, Build One South Africa, um, which I think that happened in the past month or so. Yeah. And he's a husband and a father. Mr. Jack, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you very much, Lupumo, and thank you very much for all the work you are doing. And I think uh, this is uh, actually what is definitely needed mm. uh, to try and uh, search leadership. When you find it, you empower it. Yes, sir. You conscientize it, make it aware of all qualities of leadership because mm. they are necessary yeah. and they are available and uh you doing this is a really an excellent job. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you so or much, Nandi. sir. Nandi. 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 Yeah, thank Nandi. you so Nandi. much. Mr. Jack, I want to start. Your, your story is very familiar to South Africans. Uh, your story is very familiar uh, to people that know you across Nelson Mandela Bay and the Eastern Cape. Um, but maybe to those younger people that don't know who Mr. Uh, Kusta Jack, Mr. Mkuseli Jack is, how would you introduce yourself to someone who doesn't know? Well, I mean, I can only say that I took off to a bad start uh, from day one in my life. And uh, you saw in my book, I mentioned that uh, of the eight children my mom gave birth to, mm. I was the only one that led to her to go to hospital mm. <laughs> when I was born. So it was a touch and go, but uh, I managed and uh, not only that, but uh, going on over the years, I have faced uh, horrible risks, yeah. uh, both uh, uh, natural in terms of health. Mm. I was asthmatic. I had a terrible asthma, which led me to be uh, to delay my schooling. Mm. Actually, funny enough, I was the only child who consciously wanted to be educated. Mm. And I became the one that couldn't make it to school <laughs> because my asthma was so horrible that I couldn't walk uh, for like 50 meters without having to sit down. So as a result of that, I started school at the age of uh, 10. Mm. Um, okay, I managed when I was 10 to go on, but I find also other obstacles. Uh, yeah. In the area growing on the farms, there were not enough children. By the time I reached under three, I was the only child in a classroom. I stood at three and four. I was the only child being taught in a classroom. Sure. And there was a threat the school was going to be closed every day. Mm. And I was lucky in that I I wanted, I uh, was anxious and uh, concerned. I wanted to be educated. And ultimately, I made it. Mm. When I finished then at four, then I had a problem. I couldn't go to a higher primary schools because they were in the uh, urban areas. Yeah. And uh, 
being the child from the farms, the Section 10 passed law, which restricted the movement of black people, made it difficult for farm kids to be admitted in urban schools. Mm. And uh, that led to me having to, to be lucky. I arrived at a school that didn't have, they were opening, but they didn't have enough children. They had five children to start, start mm. at five. And then I was the sixth one. And then the, the, the principal said, no, they will take me, but I must just make sure that I come into <laughs> the school during yeah. their school hours, and then I must get out of the uh, township area as quickly as I can. And I did that for two years. Wow. Sure. That is the, the greater part. Okay, the rest, uh, of course, the other problems were as a result, of course, of my being involved then in politics. Yeah. And uh, through that process, I lost four years, additional four years of schooling from mm. 1976 to 19... Uh, I finished, uh, if you like, I was taking the classroom in 20... In 19... In 1982, I was yeah. taking the classroom in Tanzania at Wongaletu High School after the night before I spoke at the memorial service of Dr. Neil Agate. Mm. That has been my life of schooling. By that time, I was already um, like 24 years old. <laughs> Sure. And uh, what is worse is that uh, during that period, I went off sc my schooling. I went through something like eight schools mm. that I've been to. So anyway, I was just determined, yeah. and I made it. And you still are very determined, well, uh, even as an elder. <laughs> with lesser energy, <laughs> yeah. but I'm still there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Jack, a lot of people... For instance, my generation, uh, the younger generation, um, we, we, we've, we've heard, we've learned about the apartheid from school. Um, I think uh, by, by 94, um, for instance, I was born in 1993. So wow. I'm very, very young. <laughs> Same age as my boy. Yeah, very, very young. So we don't have, uh, we don't have that real experience of apartheid. Um, and I'm very interested to know for you, um, what was there any moment that forced you to to or that caused that light of activi activism in you to go on? Because I, I'm assuming that there must have been something uh, in your youth that caused you to say, "I'm man." Uh, because not everyone, I'm assuming, not everyone was as active as you were in in, in politics during yeah. that time. Was there any particular incident or event that caused you to say, I must do something, I must get up, I must resist, I must, I must do something as Mr. Kustacek? Remember where I grew up, uh, I wasn't, there was nobody educated, no, there was a single book at my home, not a single one. Sure. Except, uh, of course, the only book that came to my house was a dome book, what is called the dome book. The by Dompas. A Dompas, which is a, a reference book or ID, identity book mm -hmm. that was given, which was resisted and uh, hated. So my mom would have one, and maybe some of my brothers who were and sister who were already over the age of 18, they had mm -hmm. those. You could read nothing out of that. And uh, for me, if you ask me what really made me see the world differently, but yeah. not politically, but just differently, it was the fact that when we got forced, uh, removed, unceremoniously on the farm, uh, basically kicked out by the farmer on the farm that I always thought it was our home, it was our land, um, uh, we have never been to any urban area ever in our lives. We have just been... But then we got, we became landless. Mm. That shocked me. That's when I realized the difference in South Africa. They talk of uh, whites and black people. Before that, I had no clue of that. And even so, but what happened with me was that to believe that in me, from that moment at the age of six, that's when the sense of natural justice came into me without being... At the age of six? Yes, because sure. that's the time when I saw this sad story, uh, which I write about in the mm. book, how we got uh, put on the truck, uh, not a truck, uh, I mean a, uh, what you call it, uh, ox wagon, 
with all our possessions, sharing it with pigs, chicken, and everything, you know. And uh, that occurred to me that the, this was something, there was something totally wrong that shouldn't have happened to us as human mm. beings. And from that moment, I had that. But even then, I had no clue about what is called politics or resistance or anything. This is back in 1961 or 63. So my family, I don't know, I haven't read, I haven't heard about anything. So I, that went on actually up until I was uh, basically at uh, high school when I arrived in, in Port Elizabeth to look mm. for a school. When I had, uh, if you ask what drew me to politics then, uh, effectively, it was not by design. It wasn't something that I wanted to go into. I knew that there were, things were bad and so on, but I've never heard about the ANC or PAC yeah. or any organization. But when I was told, taken out of the classroom now, that was a final straw for me, mm. and uh, told that I didn't, uh, I, I cannot be in the class because I'm not registered in the family card of the people that I was staying with. Therefore, I got kicked out of Family the classroom. Card. Yes. So that really was the reason, if you ask, that yeah. uh, threw me right into the fire. Mm. It wasn't because I wanted to be involved in politics or anything like that. So, sure. But that is the case, basically, of many of the comrades uh, uh, that uh, came through that period. Mm. Uh, mainly those who came from rural areas who became, the struggle became their refugee they just uh, uh, ran into that refuge, yeah. and we we hid on on the struggle because of that. In in uh, 1985, I think it's early July 1985, when you heard, I think you speak about this in your book, when you heard about Matthew Koniwe, Skalo, um, Shaulu Fort Kalata. Um, how 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 are you feeling? Because I'm very interested to know uh, about your relationship and your proximity to um, these struggle stalwarts that a lot of people speak about. Um, for instance, um, you know, your, the Black Consciousness Movement, your um, Robert Sobukwe, yeah. you know? Because for us, for, for the younger generation, we just read about these things. We don't, it's, we, we, we don't know how it was like. So let's start with the Credoc 4. Um, well, the credit for, <clears throat> excuse me, is 85. And uh, they were my colleagues. We were mm. all on the same boat. We were all on the same league. Well, by that time, I was a, sort of like a full-blown uh, political activist. Mm. Uh, by that time, I was really now a political activist, mm. full scale. I wasn't any... any like I, I told you at the beginning, I wasn't, I was not an activist. I was just a, uh, a person. But uh, funny enough, I just uh, always were wanting to see justice. I don't care where, yeah. even if it didn't affect me. I used to jump over the fence and go and uh, try to enforce justice, even if I. Didn't and you are very <laughs> passionate <laughs> because well, even even the videos I've watched of you speaking yeah, yeah. till this day. You yeah. speak with so much passion and yeah. No, when it comes to injustice, I just don't like it. I don't. By the way, I'm driven by hatred of bullies. Okay, bullies, ne? Uh, that's what I I grew up knowing. A bully that will come and kick you for no reason, uh, pour it, uh, yeah. uh, water over your head, <laughs> and then I realize that <laughs> if you allow a bully to do that. They must know that you will never allow them. If you don't allow them, they will never come to you. Where you are, they will never bully anybody. <laughs> even if you don't, the bully doesn't want to fight, even if it knows it's going to beat you, but it avoids you. So when the, the, the white uh, bullies in the, on the farms who used to do that, they come and open their mouth always to say derogatory statements yeah. to us. I was the first one, the <laughs> weakest of them. So you did you like fighting? Or? No, but I couldn't. But I, I was ready for a fight and to, I don't care when I'm beaten. <laughs> I, I don't think there was anyone I could beat. Because as I told you that I was asthmatic up until yeah. I was uh, like 15 years old. But most of my fights with the big bullies, I was the one. Big boys. Who would start I mean, the fight. Yeah, well, it was always going to be a fight. 
we go to a shop in those days, they're written whites, this side, none whites. I will, I will say volunteer, let me go and run and run. They know that. They say, no, because you're going to bring us trouble when yeah. you come back. I know, no, please, man, I, I want to go. I want to, I go, you know, I go to, I went to, I go to the side of the whites only. And, and then out of that, there will be all oh, swearing and uh, fight and uh, by that time, sometimes I'll fall down uh, because I, oh, 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 my oh, word. Oh, I cough, yeah. But anyway, going back to the cradle for incidental, like I say, I mean, uh, uh, Fort Kalata, Matthew Goni was a bit older than us. Uh, Fort was a year older than me. Those are the two that I know mm. of them. And the rest of the other activists from Cradock, I knew them because Cradock at that time was a, a center that emanated from the student boycott that happened in 1984, mm. leading to the arrest of uh, Mbulelo Goniwe, uh, Matthew Goniwe, Matoda Jacobs, and Fort Kalata and others. Mm. So I think that four went to was kept in Posmo prison in that in that side in the Western Cape for nearly the whole year because of the government wanted to force. Uh, Matthew to be moved away from the Craddock area okay. as a way of neutralizing him coming mm. out of prison where he was sentenced for his uh, activities uh, as was alleged then of uh, feathering the aims of communism etc. So out of that he came back to work in Craddock. So they, they were good friends of mine especially Fort was more closer to me because uh, we the two of us, uh, we were sort of like the same age, but he was already a teacher, by the way. He was already mm. married, by the way, at the time. And uh, I remember the two of us staying in Johannesburg in one of the homes of the uh, of the white activists. Yes, yes, yes. Left yes, it. And then we that. had this big house, the two. We used to say, oh, we hope the day doesn't go. The hours must stop. We want to stop the clock so that because we stay. never had such a good time living <laughs> with the, all the kind of food that yeah. was there and the water and, the, oh, it was that kind of thing. Wow. Yeah, but unfortunately, of course, uh, this incident happened uh, in, the, in June of that year. And uh, uh, like I say, we were in Johannesburg in April and the two of us, were given this big flat to stay in, mm. and then we we went to the conference or whatever congress or that was yeah. available with all the activists who go there during the day. Uh, after that, we saw each other once or twice, and then on the time of their uh, murder, uh, I didn't uh, meet with them that time because I had other engagements, and they were going to meet other comrades, and mm. that's when it happened. What happened? Now, the, the security police, uh, I understand, they trailed them from Craddock. They were aware that they were coming to Port Elizabeth. And uh, they, of course, they plotted the idea that they were going to kill them. Uh, that emanated from a meeting of Stratcom, of uh, PW board and his uh, military and security men. And they said that uh, the Craddock form must be uh, taken out. Mm. No. And has there any been has there has there been any, any justice for them since? That is what uh, his son uh, Lucanio 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 Kalata is busy with at okay. the moment. Yeah. Since 1985. Yeah. My word. And your relationship with um the Pan Africanist Congress uh, Robert Sobukwe uh, did you have any you know, tangible in-person relationship with him. No, or? I, I, I didn't. I didn't meet uh, Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe. Uh, I just knew about him. Now, as I was reading later on, remember he died on and around 1978. Mm. Uh, so we knew his story uh, properly. So you, he was a bit before your time. Robert Sobukwe was a <laughs> youth leader that led the Pan Africanist Congress and. Mm. Uh, his formation in 1958 uh, broke away from the ANC following the uh, the Congress of the People where the ANC declared that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And the Pan-Africanists uh, did not agree with that. And they broke away with uh, 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 Rob Mangaliso Sobugo, who was well known in those days, was one of the 
as shining stars of the liberation movement mm. in, on the side of the ANC. So uh, on, he, when the, the security police were arresting people, he was arrested and kept in prison in detention for more than five years mm. under what they call Sobukwe Clause. Yeah. And then thereafter, they banned him, banished him, and then <coughs> unfortunately, he, he died on and around 1978 in February. Mm. So, <coughs> excuse me, because he was a hero, and we still have the anger of the death of uh, Steve Biko in 1977, and a whole host of other activists like uh, uh, Mohapi Mopeka, uh, Joseph Mkuli, and many others that have already been dying in detention. Mm. So we were just outraged by the death of Robert Subukwe. I never met him. Mm. And you, you just spoke about uh, Steve Biko, because I just saw spe pictures online, I think, uh, of you uh, with, I think it was his son, uh, with recently his sons, yeah. uh, in Ginsberg. Um, have you ever met Steve Biko? No, I've never met Steve Biko. And uh, actually, Steve Biko, I didn't know his name before he died. Really? Until, yeah, I've never heard about him. Yeah, that's very odd. <laughs> yeah, it was. He, and uh, we, but we took up the fight for him as if we knew him. That's how things were at the time. It wasn't yeah. a question of ideological or organizational. Mm -hmm. We were united, man. We are great people, uh, Loop. So how did you come across this material then? Uh, no, we were reading about it. No, when Steve Biko died, then all of a sudden, we, me, I went back. Because oh. remember, Steve Biko and them, at the time, they were not working the way we worked later on, okay. of public platforms and big rallies and all that. Oh, underground. They, you know, yeah, because remember, they, they were the first one to, to mobilize after 1961 through the Black Consciousness Movement with mm. the student movement like SASO, uh, which was a, a radical organization, and the state suppressed them so badly. So what uh, with the people that I knew who were his uh, contemporaries are uh, people like Bani Pichana, who incidentally I was lucky. He was staying close to where mm. I'm staying, the same uh, area where I was staying, sort of street. And, uh, and I, through that, I happened to know quite a few of the black consciousness leaders. But uh, Steve Bigo, by 1977, I haven't met him. Mm. But ever since then, I, I work hard with the people that were as a junior, a sort of a runner when we were preparing the funeral of Steve Biko. Mm. And, um, oh, so you were part of preparing? Yes, just for the, no, the buses for, oh, okay. for people here, getting people and the rallies and all those oh, things. Yes. I was part of that, but as a, as a very, very junior activist. Mm. Uh, <laughs> the sad thing is that I never made it to the funeral, okay? And, uh, 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 because the last bus that we organized we couldn't collect sufficient people, nor get the money. Then I was left behind because oh I was gosh. charged to make sure that I get all the people in the bus. Charged and then who? I was going to take by the, by the senior comrades. Okay. Mostly they were students from Fort Air okay. that were giving us the, the task, you know, to do the work. Oh, that's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I miss it. Yeah, I miss it. That's so cool. so uh, over the years, of course, then I, I, I befriended the family. I pay particular attention to them. And uh, I am uh, in good uh, friendship with all mm. of them on a personal note, all yeah. the, uh, the sons and, uh, of that family and the, everybody, the members of that family. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. So um, I, 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 I want to look at AIM. I'd like us to talk about um, Bosa a bit and the fact that now you're the deputy executive mayor and what's been happening in the past couple of All months. Right. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd love to ask Mr. Jack, like who inspires Mr. Mkuseli Jack? Because you must inspire a lot of people, but who inspires the person that inspires a lot of people? You know, I mean, it's a... Uh when I grew up, I didn't have a father. 
And uh, I was told by my mother that it's not a, an entire loss not to have a father, mm. a father figure around you. <clears throat> because at the time, there were many role models, fathers. Mm. My father, my mother said, you can look up to them. And these are the people, they are here in our society. You will be good mm. because you'll be looking, role modeling yourself into a, a number of different people mm. instead of just, let's One. say, it would have been your father. Mm. So she turned the, ne the, 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 the negative into a positive, positive that <coughs> you are going to just watch, look for them. And honestly, that's what I did. Mm. Always look at men who are not liars, as you know, in our tradition and our upbringing as Tulsa people and I guess in other people, other nations, lying, uh, if you are a liar, you are, you are at the bottom of the ranks. Mm. And also, <clears throat> you are not lazy, you work hard, and you always strive to mm. do good at all material times. Mm. And uh, I formulated my life around that and also to pick up what is good mm. from whoever you get it. And uh, the truth is this, you can never get everything you need from one person. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. I um, might get from you some kind of wisdom on mm. a particular thing which you specialize on, mm. which you've concentrated on. I can <coughs> take that. But you, I cannot expect you to provide me with everything that mm. I need. So you pick up that and so on. So in a way, those are the kinds of uh, things that uh, drove me. But later on, of course, over the years, then you look at uh, the numerous leaders and you look at what they do and you, you start to admire them. And we happen to be lucky to have the likes of, uh, for, for the purpose of the struggle now, the likes of Ed Gangoy, okay, who was on Robben Island for many years, uh, Henry Fazi, and other people who were such upright men mm. who dedicated themselves to the fight for freedom. Mm. So in them, <clears throat> we saw people who really were dedicated to the liberation of our struggle and who fulfilled what we called a patriot, mm. which as young people were told, being a patriot is a critical thing. Mm. It's a good thing, it's a guiding thing. So those people were exactly that. They were not drunkards, they were not liars, they were not cowards. Mm. They were principled, they are men of integrity. I counted two, but I can count for you hundreds of yeah. them. I mean, I don't want <coughs> to do that. But uh, these people, uh, both men and women, Omamu mm. Trina, Omamu Upart, and many others that yeah. were there. And, uh, and of course, across the country, you got the same names. I mean, you will have Oma Musisulu, yes. you will have all Lilian Goyi, yeah. you will have uh, uh, a whole host of people that were powerful men and women. And uh, we saw also dedicated, educated leaders that made a difference, like about Dr. Antato Mokhana, about Tatu Achikumede from Durban, and uh, 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 these people were true examples of leadership yes. because they, <clears throat> they, they showed us that we must be educated. Mm. We must educate ourselves on the matters that we want to deal with. Mm. And also, we could be radical. Mm. Being radical doesn't mean you must be rude. You must be reckless. You must just be understanding that you are leading people. And if you lead people, you must first of all, you yourself, shape up and mm. behave in a way that is worthy worthy of you being called a leader. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, I want to fast forward to AIM, Abantu Integrity Movement. Um, I think many people around the city were very excited to hear you throw your hat in the ring when you start, started forming uh, Abantu Integrity Movement. Um, and then I think you guys got one seat, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Um, and I think a lot of people were a bit disappointed that you only got one seat, you know, after what appeared to be such a successful campaign. I mean, you were saying the right things. Um, I watched your, um, that it wasn't an interview, that debate that was moderated by JJ Tabane. Yeah. And I heard you, I saw you speaking passionately about one of the key issues you spoke about there was getting rid of the drug lords in Central. Yeah. Uh, that seems to be very close to your heart, this thing of, um, you know, doing away with, of security, let me yeah. call it that. Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, yesterday on Saturday, I was uh, a speaker at the funeral of that young girl, Zenizole Vena, who died. Uh, mother well. Mother well. And oh. uh, drugs were involved in that. And uh, the one who was uh, yes, raped. And yes, went. I was a speaker there. Oh. So, and I've just spoken now to the MMC for health and warning the criminals everywhere. And uh, I am setting a date now which I'm going to go and give them a friendly warning that they must back off. Mm. And uh, we are just waiting to get all the directorates and uh, with the mayor, we, will, we are going to embark on that. We, not uh, the police, we are going to ask the police who are doing that job, but the police will do their job when they see the commitment in the leadership yes. of uncompromising to crime. Once we show that as leaders that we, we are seeking no favors mm. and we want no approval from criminal related uh, thugs, mm. then society is going to swing behind us and the police will do their job easy. The thing is now, because the the criminals have been enmeshed. They are mixed up with uh, political leaders sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And that is where the Most problem times. is. Yes. And that is why the criminals are making such progress. Now we are going to unravel that. You will see before the end of this week, that is what's going to happen. We will be going to them. We will haunt them. And we will make them feel that they are criminals. <laughs> they are not celebrities. This is and, the person I'm speaking about. Yeah. No, definitely we're going <laughs> to do that. So... Uh, you want to know about AIM. AIM came as really a way of trying to aim us in the right direction, aiming mm. the country in the right direction, aiming the metro in the right direction. And it's not a question of me. Incidentally, I'm not in council because I want to be a councillor. I never wanted to be a councillor. I was given the opportunity. I have had it a numerous time. I never wanted Through the ANC. Yes, through the ANC or wherever. I could have been a councillor through the DA through the ANC or anyone. Have but they approached you in the past? The DA yes, at the beginning, I would have, yeah. But I never wanted to. Mm. I I decided, you see, after 1990, because I told you that my the burden of uh, uh, politics or whatever you call it on mm. my shoulders fell on me too early in my life. Yeah. And by 1990, I must confess that I was exhausted. Yeah. I couldn't get on. Mm. So I made up my mind that I want to go to the private uh, life and the private sector. And I went to university at the age of 33 mm. to in go and UK. sit in the classroom. And then I reorientated myself. And then I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to be a, a middle class of South Africa, uh, which I deserve. Each mm. and every South African deserve must be a middle class. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to be a solid middle class so that we all can be the middle class that the struggle was all about. Middle class means that you enjoy all the things that your country has. You are not, uh, you got good hospitals, you got good schools, you got, uh, 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 you take your holidays where you want them. You do everything that you want. You send your kids to the school of your choice, all those things. You get it's a job. And so, so that's what I wanted. But, okay, so now, last year, I spoke to my friends. I said, I am worried about what's going on now. Mm. And I said, listen, I still have a voice. 
it doesn't matter whether the people who listen to me or not. I'm going to use my voice now. Mm. And that's what we did. I am in council simply because in my wisdom to try to re-purpose, to redirect political leadership and also to put the municipality on the right track where people are going to do what they are employed for. The councillors take decisions and get the income they are paid for. Mm. They are not behaving like my dog. You know, my dog there at my house it will, when I come in, it jumps out of the gate and stand that side of the gate. It knows it's a crisis and I have to get him inside. And he refused to come in until he sees that I bring a biscuit. Mm. Without a biscuit, <laughs> my dog Kato is not going to come in. He is corrupt. I keep on telling him. Did you? This is corruption, Kato. Come on, you know that you need to get inside. Kato will just. Sometimes I pretend that he has, a, <laughs> he has a biscuit in my hand. He goes and looks like this and finds it's not there. And then he stands back again. So until I have to go in and go and fetch the biscuit, and Kato then, he sees, he has the biscuit. Uh, then he walks in. You can't have leaders behaving like that. Mm. Leaders have to do what they have to do without getting a biscuit that is extra. Mm. It's, it's criminal. It's, it's, it's cheating. It's not right. But So I, I, I'm there. Let me tell you this. If you go, you're going to do me a favor, get me out and put me back and go on with my life that I did. But the good news is that I have demonstrated that I want to make a solu uh, to solve the problems. Mm. I, I can solve the problems. But if you allow me to do so, I'm going to do it. And I want to do it. If you refuse, you stop me from doing it. Tough luck. I can go back and sit with my heart free and my soul happy that I tried and I made it clear what I can do. Mm. And that's why up to so far, Lupumo, I have interacted last week alone with hundreds of young people, young leaders, which would have never been there. Well, like you now, mm. you see, I'm, you're going to be, I'm trying to get the good young people to shine in this country. Mm to be on top of us, mm. not to get the best of our people and be hidden and take the mediocre and put it on top. Yeah. This is not right. We can't progress like yeah. that. We can only progress and grow as a nation when we put our best people forward. Mm. You cannot go to the United, to what is Olympic Games and take the worst runners and put them there yeah. and hope that you, they are not even allowed to get in there. Mm. Simple. Yeah. You got them. I'm, I don't mind if you, if you don't have them. Your standard is so low, that's fine. That's your standard. Then you must work with what you have. But you can't consciously knowing that you've got the best brain amongst your own people. Yeah. You suppress them. No, that's not right. The best <clears throat> young people must be put forward. That's mm. all what I'm saying. Uh, I, I want to take you two, two steps back, Mr. Jack, because I've heard you speaking about this vision of a South Africa of a people that are in the middle class that can enjoy everything that can fly around the world, you know, when they wish. Um, but I've often wondered about the practicality of that. How do you get South Africa uh, there, you know? Listen, we were, on, we, were, we were on the road there, okay? Listen, the detractors who destroyed everything, they are the, own no the only noise makers that are talking nonsense and telling us that, no... This was not possible. Listen here. During Mandela's time, South Africa was... Mandela got uh, a South Africa that was broken because of the economic sanctions and the yes. political mismanagement yes. of the apartheid government. Yeah. Uh, what happened? They, they plowed their resources into trying to prop up apartheid. Mm. And they did not develop. So they started to run short of money because of that. Then, so... When we came in, we came in with a correct vision and the world believed us and we started to take off quickly mm. and well. And, and you must remember at the time we were integrating uh, the nine puppet states that were created by the apartheid yeah. government, yeah. Transkai, Siskai, Buputatswana, yeah. Kazankulu, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. The, all those things were self-governing, some of them so-called independent. Mm. They were running their own little things there. So there was no development in those countries. So when Mandela came, 
They united the country, as we said during the struggle, that we were fighting for a democratic, united, and non-racial South Africa. So we were on path. Mandela was focusing on that. And uh, he was doing a good job. And then uh, when Thabo Mbeki came in, Thabo Mbeki then came with an economic plan mm. that was going to take us forward. There was a policy called the R. Uh, Reconstruction and Development Program, RDP, mm. yes. which was meant <clears throat> to, to, to meet uh, all the, uh, the backlogs that were there and to fix the inequality mm. and to provide our people with all uh, the necessary uh, services and facilities they didn't have before. And um, this was, of course, a, a program that needs funding to do it. And then what happened, as time goes, they realized that, no, the RDP was good in telling us what we must have and wanting what we ought to have. But it was weak on income or revenue generation yeah. to meet the obligation that we wanted. And then they came with a new policy. That policy was called, I think, GEAR. Yes. And uh, that growth uh, uh, policy was meant to grow the economy to focus on growing the economy. Mm. And growing the economy would have meant that you are going to generate more revenue for the country so that you are able to fund your RDP program, yes. whether you call it RDP or you don't. But those things you want to do, good schools, good hospitals, good roads, electricity for everyone, water, etc., etc., has to be funded. No. Other people saw came up with a... a, a, a uh, obsolete, uh, obsolete uh, 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 policies uh, or uh, like of uh, uh, ideologies, they were uh, hell-bent on that. Mm. They resisted that program. They never allowed it to take its place when we were attracting investors, mm. when we were attracting people. And the growth in real terms was uh, hitting something like 5% at the time, which we were moving we were going to go to the level seen in China because of like 10 or 12, we would have met them. But midway, they played on the ignorance of our people by spreading the idea that this was new liberal policies, et cetera, et cetera. And then in return, they put themselves in. But what they put in were people who came in not only did they even attempt to bring the communism they wanted to bring, they brought a criminal mafia state mm. that just stole everything. As you know now, uh, the railways are down. The railways used to employ thousands and thousands of people. Mm. They are on the verge of uh, just uh, scrapping for money to survive as mm. we speak now. Trans <clears throat> you speak about... Uh, 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 the railway, SA, South African Airways, yeah. as you know, they put board members and people who had no clue of what was happening. They In ESCOM, they did the same thing. That is why today you got uh, uh, this load shedding. Mm. It's precisely because of those people who fought against a policy that was a policy that was going over a period. They didn't allow it to go for 10 years. <clears throat> had they allowed that, then the, 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 the result of that economy growth would have filtered to everybody mm. and created a country that was growing. Now, we are a country that has been shrinking ever since they took over mm. with their uh, kind of uh, version <coughs> of economics. It, you know, <clears throat> my last question on this issue, because I'd love to get into uh, Mr. Jack, the businessman, and hear more about some of your um, views on entrepreneurship and what advice you can give young people who aspire to be like you. Um, <clears throat> but on, 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 on this question, because later on I'd like us to look at some of the solutions, because I think a lot of the times we know the problems. I mean, every politician I meet, we know what the problems exactly. are, but very few people are able to articulate practical solutions yeah, exactly because that's what i'd love to hear maybe a bit later on um uh but i wanted i wanted to maybe let's let's go into your entrepreneurial journey yeah, okay uh, for a few minutes um i tried to look up mr jack 
what your businesses are and I saw something on construction and you know um how how has your business journey been for the past three decades um from what I hear you are very very successful in business <laughs> <laughs> you're very <laughs> no 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 in uh, in business success is current okay uh, I can tell you I'm successful now but, but tomorrow. within seconds I could be broke and uh, worse poorer than the church mouse <laughs> so <laughs> uh, look, look here's the thing I got in when personally when I got into business I wasn't thinking about being a mega businessman I got into business hoping that I'm just going to have an income to just uh, as I would have had when I was uh, working for somebody mm. so Basically, you also, this is a thing you young people don't understand. Mm. You must remember this thing. Ne? Any person from my group who tells you that he knew that we would be in government in 1994 talks nonsense. Okay. Absolute nonsense. Anyone of us who says to you, we had a plan how we are going to govern talks nonsense. We didn't plan the actual nitty gritties of governance. We had the principle of mm. liberation that we have to be liberated. But during, because of the enemy that we are fighting, we have budgeted that we were just going through motions of weakening the government mm. to be defeated by coming generations, mm. not by us. So we didn't have a plan for how in practical terms we will run the economy. But we had an idea of hating an economic <coughs> system that was exploitative, that was capitalistic, that was uh, 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 ripping our, our, our minerals and taking them to other places. So we were of the view that those kinds of things will be stopped. Mm. As you hear in the Freedom Charter, we were going along those lines. That's mm. the South Africa we, in the broad terms. But given the fact that we were not, during the struggle, sitting in jail or fighting around saying that, okay, once we come into power, let's say in 1994, we will get into power. What we will do, we'll do this and that and that. We knew that the police will be humane. We, they will be protecting our people. The army will defend our country and all those things. Then... I'm saying this because people don't understand how some of us have changed drastically to the worst after freedom. Mm. None of us ever thought of ever uh, being owning a big company, et cetera, et cetera. But what we thought, by the way, we did not like business at the time. Mm. Eh? By 1990, still, we didn't like business generally. We, because of our... Condition. experience of <clears throat> white South Africa's business at the time in its treatment of black people on race and general economic just exploitation at the labor uh, uh, front. So for that reason, we had a, a negative view against uh, 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 businesses. But so I got into business I had the idea that in business, I'm going to just go and float nicely and have everything because I've seen my white friends or people <laughs> that are doing business. I thought for me, oh, it's just to get in. <laughs> but to my horror, my first two businesses were a disaster. They mm. failed before they could even give me a cent. Which businesses were those? No, I, first I started by uh, trying to build the RDP houses because we were told that so many houses, so I ran into that too mm. and started, wow, what a disaster. What a, so the, uh, then the, the government, the ANC, has not at the time planned thoroughly how mm. this thing was going to be done. They were planning as we go, mm. you know? But fortunately, they were trying at the time. They were yeah. not stealing the money. They were doing the right things. But it was tough. So for you, you I dropped my job where I was working, having a salary, good job, for something that I was hoping I'm going to get money from. 
then I ended up not getting the Anything. job, not taking up because there was so many bureaucratic new things and so on. And months are going, 12 months is a lot for a person. Remember, you need yeah, only yeah, three yeah. months and then you know you are in big trouble. Mm. So uh, there was those failures and so So what I did, given that um, uh, at the time I have just returned from university and uh, I was a... Uh, uh, I did uh, some statistics or research things. I'm an economist. I studied economy and development studies so I could uh, uh, guide uh, people mm. uh, and make money out of consultancy. Okay. So surviving from that, from hand mm. to mouth, it was risky. And then I started to to buy trucks and then they went bust. It was bad news. I was What year was that when you bought trucks? 1998, 97, 98. 97. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was just one disaster after the other. And, uh, but all what I'm saying, mm. a young person who goes into business must just go there knowing that it's a rough world. Yes, yes. But it's a rewarding <clears throat> world. It takes time. Yeah. It's not easy. You're not going to get things as the way you want. Yeah. People who you thought are your friends, I got ready things to help you, they will turn and look at the other side. Because mm. obviously you can't blame them. Yeah. They don't trust you. You haven't done this thing. Yes. So why would they disappoint their clients with you? Yeah. So there are those things. And the other thing is this, that, yeah, you got to be, uh, when you do business, you must just be sure that you are determined mm -hmm. and you are honest. Tell the people when they come and do work for you that I don't have the money to pay you now. Yeah. I'm expecting to be paid by so-and-so. So-and-so, if he pays me, I'm going to pay you. Mm. And when that so-and-so pays you, pay him immediately. Mm. Don't do anything else. Yeah. Because that you mishap on that one, you're dead mm. in the water. Because all the other people... That person will tell them that what yeah. you he's going to drown you, and nobody wants to be drowned. You're gone. So you must just be open and say that, and and always do say you're gonna do something, and make sure that you do, you do what yeah. you said you are going to do, even if it means you are not going to profit, make the profit out of that. Mm. Just make sure that you do the thing the way the client or customer wanted it. If you do that, you can't go wrong because the person will come back. Business is all about mm. uh, uh, the comeback, you know, a repeat business. Yes. It's not about you think that you're going to be wealthy with a once-off uh, uh, purchase or transaction. Mm. You're going to be wealthy by numerous small pieces of transactions. Yes. That is going to make you uh, what you want to be. And the other thing is you must always uh, speak to people, if you go and loan money from somebody, pay that money back. Yeah. Even if you think that you got uh, connections at the highest <coughs> level, <laughs> pay the person his money. Mm. It does you no good not to pay the person that you owe money. And um, you must also uh, always encourage people who can do the job. You don't mm. have to do it as an entrepreneur. You don't have to do it yourself. It's not your job. Mm. Go and get people who can do the job properly mm. and pay for it if you can mm. because you're going to look good, not the person you employ. It's Correct. your company that will go forward. Yeah. And um, so, and if you are a young person, read mm. about entrepreneurs that have made it from mm. nothing like you mm. because... If, for example, you go and read about the story of uh, Oppenheimer's son mm. or Rupert's son, it doesn't help you to be jealous about that. Mm. Actually, it's foolish to be jealous and be resentful <clears throat> about people who have made it. If, by the way, the Oppenheimers here, they came with like 26, 26 pounds here. Mm on and around 1901 or 1906, the first one to arrive here. Mm. That's all he had, okay, with a suitcase. Today, look what they have. So success has nothing to do with <clears throat> the fact that, oh, look what he is. But look the behavior of the successful person, whether he's a murderer, 
whether he's a thief, whether he's a politician, whether he's a what. Mm. All that's, of them. That's a very hard saying, Mr. Jack. <laughs> that's a very hard saying. Yes. Because these people are, I mean, their success is from, it's, 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 from, it's, it's built out of the, the pain of The ingredients of success are the same. Patience. Honesty. Hard work. Your word must be your word. You can't be saying this and people you think and you think you will succeed. You will never succeed. You must be focused. And so people must read about mm. people of similar background. In yes. the books that you see, you'll find people that uh, uh, this suits you. For example, I like a guy called Alan Sugar. Okay. Alan Sugar read, the, I mean, uh, was the chairman of the Tottenham Hotspurs. That's how he was known by many people. Mm. But his story is a typical story for a township person mm. who comes from a family that has no business. Mm. Okay? Because I was just about to say, because we don't relate to Oppenheimers. And no, you can't. Our stories are not never the same. Be able. So how and can also, we... let's say you look at somebody like uh, Donald Trump. Donald mm. Trump also is not a good example because he goes about trying to say that he's self-made. He's not self-made. His father gave him money exactly. to make that. Exactly. You're going to look for people who are like you, who didn't have, who got parents, who didn't have we money. We want to look at people from like you. Nothing. Exactly. Then you, that's how you role model yourself. Then if you do that, you're going to be patient. Mm. You're going to know what you want. You are not going to be in a hurry. You are not going to be easily distracted. You're going to go on. Now, uh, another example of a known uh, businessman is this uh, Richard Branson. Mm. Richard Branson's style, which will only work for him, it won't work for everybody else, mm. is that he, he pegged himself to the big birds, you know, and uh, he used them um, to, to, to get attention and build his entrepreneurship Mm. by fighting those uh, big bullies. Yes, it worked for him, mm. and he succeeded. But that's not going to be everybody cup of, uh, what is it, cup, cup of, of tea. tea. Yeah. yeah, People <coughs> got different ways. Yes. But your or, uh, average person is a person that is going to say now, and that where, that's where we are now. For example, you can't uh, uh, use uh, many of the uh, black mining uh, magnets that we have because they were given. Many of them. Like Petrus Mutsipe. Well, Patrice Mutsipe is half-half uh, because remember he, Patrice Mutsipe, because I know his story, I cannot agree to that uh, narrative because I was told by bankers mm. how Patrice Mutsipe used to come to their offices and ask them to, uh, to fund something. Mm. <laughs> they say Patrice could come within one month with about five different projects mm. that he wants to fund. So the it's first a hard one, worker. Yeah, the first yeah. one, he failed. They said, no, it will never work, Patrice. And Patrice says, but why? Why would it work? And they say, no, because of this and that and that. And Patrice listens. He goes and rewrite <laughs> another proposal and come back and say, here's what I want to do. The beggar says there were times when they used to run and hide away because they don't want to listen wow. to his that seeker. But you see, because wow. then he will come and adjust and improve mm. and come up with something. Resilience. And that's that's the kind of thing that we want yeah. because you 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 don't want to uh, the people who, who, who succeed by fluke and you use them as role models to our children. Yeah. You're gonna hurt our children by that mm. because they're gonna think all of a sudden they will be. So you're gonna get, but the rest of the others were just people who were just drawn yeah. in, come in, join us, <clears> and <throat> then you do this, yeah. and so on and so forth. Mr. Jack, we're running out of time and there are two or three You wanted more to issues. hear about Bosa. Yes, yes, because I, I still want to hear about that, but I, I one last thing on this entrepreneurship thing. So when was, when did the breakthrough come for you personally? What happened when you thought, yeah, hey, I now, you know, My I've arrived. Came, if you call it a break, it's funny. I went down. I haven't since, remember, I said that I wasn't active uh, in politics between 1990 and uh, up until, uh, if you like, now, uh, last year when I started to form AIM. But, but in 2009, between, though, no, you were 2009, there. because of the opposition that I had to yeah. the 
a Pulukwane outcome. Yeah. That's what brought me back, you yes. see. But before that, I wasn't. I was not interested. I was yeah. just living my life, uh, just not interested. Enjoying your money? Children. No, not enjoying <laughs> money. But I was. <laughs> the little that I had, I was enjoying it, but I didn't have uh, that much. But my break came through Tokyo Sequale, if truth be told. Okay. I went down one day to an ANC, what do they call it, uh, the January uh, statement in oh, Durban. Yes. Then I had what nothing. What year was that? Uh, it must have been 2003 or two, 2003. Ne? Yeah, mm. it must be 2003. Then I went down there. I was already in business and doing some businesses and so on. But I arrived there. And funny enough, I have seen some people and so on. And uh, then Tabo Mbeki was uh, came like this uh, in front of me, and then I was advancing to him. Then while I was going to Tabo, I see Tokyo. Tokyo. I say, hey, Tokyo, come on. You are making everybody wealthy. You are leaving me <laughs> <laughs> poor there in Nelson Mandela in Port Elizabeth. Ba, 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 ba. And then I attack him. Ba, talk. Wow, wow, wow. Help Kusel. Yuma, Yuma, Yuma Kusel. <laughs> and really, and then of course, uh, out of that, Tokyo drew me into a deal with one of the uh, oh, national nice. banks. And then that was, uh, I must say, breakthrough. Me a little bit, uh, yeah. Oh, wow. It helped me. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I, I, I want to get into, you're currently executive mayor of Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, I think we, we, when, when the previous, um, I mean, executive deputy mayor, when the previous mayor, Ms., Mrs. Eugene Johnson, started her office, um, we, we saw pictures of, you guys working well oh, together. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so where did this thing no, collapse? Because it, it feels like you betrayed her. No, no, not at all, not at all. I supported her. I had nothing to do with what people were talking about uh, in terms of uh, uh, inexperience in governance mm. and skill and uh, even academic and all the, those things don't matter in, uh, in politics, uh, really. They shouldn't. Competence doesn't matter. No, no, no. Remember, in leadership, what you, what you can do, you can get in there. No one is going to come in there with uh, perfect with all what mm. is required. But what happened is your ability to use the people around you, and then you're going to be great. And I think Eugene started to do that because, first of all, Eugene came in. She was a clean person in terms of corruption and all that. Mm. And she got a good heart and she got a good idea. She was uh, also a progressive person generally. She, and I know her. And when she came for the greater part of the time when we were helping her, she was like that. She's not a, she was not a, a mean-minded person. She was a person who... who she was nice. No, not, but pragmatic also. Uh, uh, just that she wasn't also an ideologue. But things... What do you mean got, by ideologue? No. Uh, Ideological. Like, no, yeah, she wasn't like okay. that. She was just a pragmatic that things must happen. And she was getting the full support of the mayoral committee, which is critical. And she was doing, making progress. But the, when we had a, a difference, our fight started in one day, and it was it. It was to do with the city manager. Okay. And then, of course, from there onward... The current acting that was... The one was that was... Uh, arrested charged, now. Yeah, arrested, yeah. Uh, that's... So, the, the, there, even there, what happened is that the, the ANC wanted to force its will upon the rest of us when we said that we don't want to appoint the, the city manager. Mm for a whole host of reasons. And then the ANC took exception, or elements of the ANC. And from there onward, the whole thing was a uh, relationship collapse. It collapsed. And actually, funny enough, uh, the two people who are charged are at the center of the collapse of that whole thing. Oh. The city manager 
and their secretary. Regional both of them, yeah, secretary. both of them. But nonetheless, remember, they also make this issue that uh, we, I, I, what is the word, I marked when I was in it during the interview, the city manager highest. Oh. I did, it's true. But it's just that in the ANC or the current ANC world, you can't do that if you do not agree with a person. If, if I don't like you, I must say no. Uh, even if you, you, you get five, I'll say no, you got five, you got two pieces of bread. I say you can't do that. You've mm. got to be realistic. Here you pose a question and the person answers that question. You mark that person according to that. Mm. So, by the way, in my view, uh, Dr. Nwazi is a competent person. And she was capable, in my opinion, in every way, even in my dealings with her. It's just that the toxic nature uh, of the ANC interference is a root cause of the current problems that many of the bureaucrats or civil servants are facing across the length and breadth of the country. They work through them and unfortunately, no matter how good they are, they end up being destroyed, end up in courts, in jails, and so on. So the, <clears throat> the, the temptation of seeking gratification or aggrandizement from people who propel you to do wrong things is no smart thing to do but but mr jack surely they can just say no that well, that's, that's not we can't yeah, always be should, blaming yeah, people should yeah but but unfortunately people love uh luck yeah you know? so it's them it's not just the toxic nature of the, it's it's them because they say yes they agree to these things yeah so we they, can't because because yeah you're right you're right you're right they this is a lesson that they shouldn't mm. but what i'm trying to say to you i've seen good people being okay. destroyed uh, through this process because uh, when people make you do something wrong which you wouldn't do on your own but because you want to hold on on the position and because of the nature of the economy in this country such that if you lose your job you are not going to get it anywhere so you could so just you hold as well just hope that these people will protect you all the time who made you in the first place to do the wrong things. Uh, so, yeah, I think that uh, it's sad. And Eugene, on her own, then after that, she just got out of control and we couldn't. I mean, I won't say many of the things that were so mm. drastically strange that were happening immediately as she got loose from us and got under the clutches of the city manager, and that was it. We couldn't mm. do anything Let's. Uh, <coughs> I supported her. There's no doubt up to mm. that point. There is nothing that can be shown that I never supported her. I supported her even when she was down and any time I was saying, don't worry. Let's go through as long as we do the right thing. Even the people, during the, yeah, during this that thing of the water crisis and what she was saying on the radio and TV. Well, yes, why she was still, we were still not having this problem. We were begging her, telling her, don't worry, you can't make the mistake. There's nothing wrong. It's not the end of the world. We are all making mistakes. You are not a perfect, you mm. never came in and said you are a perfect person. So if you make a mistake about something, that's it. So let's go on. Okay. It's not the end of the world. Everybody can make a mistake. Mm. Let's, let's look at Bossa. Yeah. Um, I think many of us were very surprised when we saw you. Uh, ascend that stage in Soweto uh, as the chairperson of Build One South Africa Muslim Imanis Movement. How did that conversation start? No, remember, from... Uh, <laughs> let me start by saying that. I wish a lot of you guys don't know. Do you know how many little organizations were formed before apartheid was between the period, let's say, Sasso period and the BPC which were the first organizations that were formed in South Africa up to 1990. Mm. <laughs> A lot. Yeah. But just imagine by the time the UDF was formed in 1983, at least those who subscribed to the UDF were close to 800 sure. little small organizations. Mm. So I work on the assumption that I know that you can... When you have little people knocking in mm. every corner, 
of this house, ultimate, you're going to bring it down. Okay. And the house, right? the house in that context is the ANC? Whatever, yes. Because as things stand now, the ANC, by its own admission, is totally mm. operating on sentiment and nostalgia. Nothing, no solution, nothing. Mm. They changed now the ESCOM board. I mean, the issue, ESCOM board is a board, bro. The board <laughs> sits there, it has to sit three, four times a year. Mm. That's a normal board. Okay, if it's abnormal like that one, it's going to sit eight <laughs> times, all right? <laughs> if really it's ridiculous now, it becomes a, a money-making thing, they will sit, I Once don't know, month. every month, yeah. which is criminal, by the way. You can't do that. Mm. So those board members... There's nothing they're going to bring. Like you were saying here, South Africa, there's nothing that they, even the ANC that doesn't know what is good. ANC knows everything that is right mm. and what ought to be done. Mm. Their weakness is not able, is inability to do it. Mm. That's all. Ah, nothing else. So uh, to bring now a new board, with the hope that the board is going to, to make a difference. It's crazy, mm. absolute crazy. At best, they can bring somebody, they, it can work, actually, they bring somebody amongst these people, they interview them mm. and find the best one. They can put him in the job, to do the job, mm. they, and, and replace, let's say, a rater, if they feel like. But to bring a board, what is that board going to do? Like I tell you, the board is going to sit only for four months is normally. Mm. And then, okay, but it's abnormal. Once a board starts to sit more than that four months, there's something wrong with that company. Mm. So you don't have to, what is it going to do? Now it's going to intervene there and go and fix the plants and all that. They it's going to provide that. strategic direction. What strategic direction? <laughs> no, they need to get us <laughs> electricity. Let's let's look at BOSA. Yeah. <coughs> How did that happen? Well, BOSA... Since uh, a few years ago, I have been thinking about being part of a, a front, a mm. national front. A national front will be an organization that you build from scratch with no political celebrities or known figures or bend out politicians, but you get fresh people. And then you look at organizations that have similar values in the same mode as a, the, no, the United Democratic Front was not strictly on, on values that they must be the same. There, the only thing that we wanted from you is you believing that apartheid. The mission. Has, yeah, to, to break apartheid down to fight against apartheid. So we, we brought them that way. But with a front like this one now, you are not going only to bring people who want to bring the ANC down, but you are going to look for people who have the same values mm. and, um, and who, who got the same vision of the South Africa, a one South Africa. That's why you want to build one South Africa. As we said during the struggle days, a united democratic non-racial South Africa, mm. non-sexist South Africa. That's what we wanted to build. And we want to pull people back to that. A South Africa that will be uh, uh, see to it that there's equality for all people in mm. the country, that will develop prosperity for everyone, mm. that will make sure that there is houses and security for everyone and that there is comfort for every South African, and that there's no, the people are not uh, found themselves in a situation where uh, they cannot access education, they cannot mm. have jobs. Hence, Musa <coughs> Maimane is calling for Bosa to make sure that when it comes into power, it works towards making sure that as a first task, to get a job in every home. Mm. Because if there's somebody, that's how you empower people. Not but to. how do you do that? How do you get a job? In you, <laughs> you, you stop this nonsense here of believing that uh, 
investors are enemies. As we speak now, companies around here are looking for new investment places where mm. they can take their various manufacturing factories to. That is going to spell disaster for us. And the, 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 the investors must see now leaders that can be trusted, leaders that got integrity, leaders that are totally opposed to, to all forms of discrimination, corruption, criminality, and all the kinds of things that you see now. If you get that, then investors, incidentally, they want to be in South Africa. Mm. But the toxicity of our leadership here is pulling them out. <laughs> they are prepared to go and sit in a conference with the president and pledge to the president every second time the president calls them, oh, I'll put a trillion, I'll put a billion. They never come <laughs> down to the ground. But we need to get people who trust, who trust mm. the leadership of the country. And with Musi pulling up now a new generation of young people, yeah. you're going to see the kind of people that are drawn into this movement. Mm. This movement is going to be pulling all uh, uh, young South Africans who have a dream of being patriots, who love their country, who don't want their country to go down, who understand that if we build our country, then everything else will be good for us. Mm. We will not even be worried <coughs> about the, uh, the, 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 as people do now with foreigners and so on and so on. We will have total control and make sure that we, we keep our borders closed properly and people come into the country to contribute in the country, not to come here illegally and engage in illegal activities. Yeah. So we will have a total control. Through that, you will employ, you will restore the numerous uh, 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 things that used to work, which are job creation, like the railways. The railways were a mega job creator in this country. Mm. Actually, not even far away. I was surprised when they were building trains far away. This Yutnik was built on the back of the railway mm. line in this country, mm. railway system. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your time, Mr. We, unfortunately, <coughs> all of some of the things I wanted to get into, we can't get into because of time. Because I was going to ask a follow-up question about the you policy. Can. You can, and then you... The policy of Bosa. What are some of the... Maybe um, as a final question... Um, Surely, I mean, we we've, we we know Musi Maimane through the DA, through the One South Africa movement, which wasn't really a political party, but in the DA, the DA spoke um, against BEE, you know? So ideologically, I know that you've been saying you are not, um, this is not about ideo ideologies, but to a certain extent, that informs the policy uh, of, of whatever vehicle you are going to use to um, change this South Africa into the South Africa that you're speaking about. Are there any, have you discussed any of those things in terms of BE, what you guys are going to do, or or is it just about... Look, I mean, uh, a BE is already contested, but BE is a necessary uh, imperative of South Africa. The the talk about a BE, negative talk, it has been the way it has been applied. Okay. I mean, if you look the the foolishness that has been done, you put a priest to run, let's say, ESCOM, for example, you can't do that. That's not a job of a priest. You need to get <laughs> an engineer with experience to run ESCOM. Okay. I might be making a too much of yeah. an unnecessary <laughs> yeah. example. Okay, let's say a. Uh, but I think it, we let's get say the a point. Traffic cop, uh, not even that is still a the priest. same. Let's say a teacher. Let's say. Uh, but that's what the ANC does. Let's say the carpenter. Let's say. Catered deployment. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, that is where the problem is. Yeah. We cater de de deployment must be dealt with. It's wrong. It's destructive. It is a cause of the destruction of SAA. Transnet, Dinel, everything that we had. Uh, remember, ESCOM was amongst the 
stop SOEs in the world, my brother. I didn't know that. Yes, it was. It was. And the most, not only being top, but the most well run. How do you was go and kick out? Day? How do you go and kick those people when you don't have people to replace them with? They are not our cadres. Yeah? Yes, that's a mistake they did. You don't do that. What you do, personally, every business that I have bought, I've never got in there and fired the people. Mm. Never. I keep it. And I tell the people, listen, let's build this business for my vision. I mm. want to get black people here to participate, to grow, and to be in bigger numbers. But first of all, let's make the business viable to achieve that goal. What is the point of hollowing a business and then you bring black people <laughs> into it? It's crazy. <laughs> I don't believe in that nonsense. In practical time, I mean, I, I got a business here we bought uh, many years ago with some people. Uh, when we bought it, it had about uh, eight white people. It was not a single black person. And then these white people on the night we bought it, they were so worried. They said, <laughs> oh, Mr. Jack, what's going to happen to us? I said, listen, you got, I don't, what are you talking about? I want you to return, I want my money back that we, yeah. we're going to get a big loan mm. for this thing. It must be paid. Mm. I want you to do the job. Just go and concentrate on that. Leave mm. me alone. Eh? And he said, are you not going to replace? Black people will come in a functioning and viable, yeah. financially viable business. Mm. And that business today is so huge. And there's so many uh, wow. uh, black people there fitting like a glove. Mm. Just like, you know, like the Springbok, by the way. If you look at the Springbok, had you listen to some of the people who were trying to jump and uh, because they want, people want to see the end result with no effort. Mm. No, there's no such thing. When we, we integrated, obviously we had a lot of problems. Uh, but as time goes, when they were allowed, to do what they have to do, the Springboks. Look how many black Springboks are there yeah. now, okay? They don't go there as a favor. Mm. They wear that jersey With in pride. their own terms. Mm. That is good. Mm. When they get kicked out, we don't say they are after a black person, uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they are after a player who didn't practice, yeah, who didn't true. go and train. That's, that's it. Keep your fitness and that's keep true. your position. That's true. That's the same in business. Mm. So... Uh, to say uh, Musi is opposed to, I will never believe that because when we talk, we are all on par on the idea that we need to make the country work. Okay. South Africa must be made to work and to build South Africa, we're going to build one South Africa. By the way, the United States of America, it has people from all corners of the world. Mm. It emerged to be the biggest center uh, economy of the world mm. for many years. So there's no such thing that you have to... Uh... Yo, my time. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah, <laughs> let me... One last thing, one last thing. What do you do to relax? You, you're, you're, you're a very busy man. Businesses, politics, family. What do you do to, to relax? I train. I got a personal trainer. Oh, that's nice. I go every... Second day mm. for uh, fitness training. I walk my dogs. Okay. I walk on the beach a lot. Mm. I walk in the walking trails. And I read a lot of books. Two books you can recommend? Uh, Besides your one, by the <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> that will be seen. Uh, you know... Oh, you caught me there now. In the last month, what have you been reading? I've been reading about, for the last two months, I read about six books of yeah. uh, Vladimir Putin. Okay. Yeah. Would you recommend? <laughs> nah, not really. <laughs> nah, nah. They, they are very, no, nah, no, nah, they are not good. Yeah. But it's just that for me, it was for historic reason because okay. I followed Putin for a long time. Mm. I was reading about him a long time ago. But I, I read about him now again. Mm. So that's what actually I've been doing. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for your time, sir. You're Wish welcome. you all the best. Uh, please stay the person that you are. A lot of young South Africans are looking up to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Three, two, one. Yeah.
Ja, nein, ist doch genug, ne? <lacht>